Here's a question from the golf and tourism industry. And we will start with by coin toss assemblyman Earth. The mesquite economy has been struggling over the past few years, as all of you know. Please cite some examples of things you can do to help the tourism industry here in Mesquite at the federal level. I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand. it's okay. Uh, from the federal level, sometimes it becomes very difficult, but you have to listen to your constituents and the folks that, uh, uh, the city councils and your water board members to see what needs they, they have. But from, for his business in this community, what will help our community grow and prosper is not just for the golf industry. We need a diversified economy. And this country that we have is losing businesses overseas. I believe I have an answer to be able to make sure that we bring those businesses back home. we got to stop borrowing more money from China. We've got to stop lowering their, uh, devaluing their dollar by then letting purchase our dollars at $2 billion a day to make sure that we provide the opportunity where they have to be on an equal basis. We need to look at our economy in the same way that President Reagan looked back in the 80s. The Japanese were doing the same thing. They were buying the dollar down and having a 20% uh, lower value of their, their dollar, which they could come over here and compete, <coughs> basically without competing. We need to do the, put a countervailing duty, just like President Reagan did, on the uh, Japanese to make sure that we do the same thing with the Chinese to make sure businesses have an opportunity to come home and develop here in Mesquite. We are a great place for manufacturing or anything else to happen in this community, not just golf courses, but we need to be diverse, and I think I can do that back in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. First, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me uh, to be here. It's great to be here with my colleague and opponent, Assemblyman Hardy. Uh, and I want to start by saying uh, I commend him for his years of service uh, to this community in particular um, because he has made a tremendous impact. And I'm very uh, proud to be here uh, tonight with him. Uh, and to all of you and the moderators, specifically to the question, uh, what can we do at the federal level to support uh, the golf industry and other industries? Uh, primarily, it's what I have been doing, working with your mayor and city council on the Mesquite Lands Bill, which will transfer land from the BLM to the city of Mesquite in order to develop a new airport and uh, other uh, manufacturing and economic development around the airport uh, because this is a great community. Uh, you all, uh, many of you moved here from other places because it's such a beautiful community. Uh, and people want to come here and, and uh, visit our golf courses. They want to spend uh, nights in our hotel rooms, uh, get spa packages, or just relax. Uh, and we need to promote that because uh, this is a very unique and beautiful community that is so special. We have uh, one of the best golf courses in the world right here in Mesquite. And we're here at and Corey and his, his team uh, promote this facility and other golf courses in the area. And I can tell you when I talk about my district and I talk about the fact that I represent portions of uh, Mesquite and other places, and I tell them that Wolf Creek golf course is one of my districts. People tell me all the time, when can we go out there to golf? Uh, so we've got to continue to promote it, but one way is to get this land bill passed so we can get more people here through our airport. At this point, I'll be turning over like we've done in the past, like questions to our media. Uh, I would ask you though, please hold your applause to the very end. Uh, and if you have any comments, please hold them to the end also so we can just expedite the questions. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, President. Thank you for coming down. The ACA has resulted in Nevada's uninsured rate dropping 7%, and local Mesa View Hospital reports a significant increase in newly insured customers. Despite all the website problems in Nevada and nationally, the projections for enrollment have been, well, have been well exceeded and the rise in health insurance premiums has dropped to the lowest rate since before Reagan. 
do you still support the repeal of the ACA? And if so, why and what would you replace it with? I still uh, stand that we need to repeal the ACA, repeal and replace. There are certain pieces of that ACA <coughs> that we all understand that are valuable. Uh, the pre-existing conditions, your uh, children will be able to stay on until they're 26. We haven't seen the real impact of this insurance, I don't believe, as a business person. Reports are already showing that there will be 30 million people, 30 million people that will lose their insurance. We were... Thank you. We were promised that we'd be able to keep our insurance. Uh, some may have not uh, seen that increase, and many of them may have to gain the value of having the insurance. But businesses are, are going to have to make a decision. The business that I once owned, that was just sold to my partner last year, he's already having to decide whether he can keep those insurance rates, uh, insurance that we've been supplying uh, for years now, or let it go and take the penalty, because it's extremely uh, a high opportunity to lose it. He just soon give that money to his employees. But I think <coughs> once this hits, I think you're really going to see the real cause and effect of the ACA. People uh, may have benefited, but I think many more people will lose. Thank you. Uh, this is about the ACA as well. You supported the state of Nevada building and operating its own health care exchange, uh, Xerox. These are five questions for each representative in a row. So Mr. Hardy will do five questions in a row. And then Mr. Okay. <laughs> Governor Sandoval's administration has now spent over $52 million to a private contractor and the site still doesn't work. The state decided to spend another $25 million to migrate it to the federal site. This seems to have perfectly fit your standard philosophies of government, that the state should be in charge and that the private industry does jobs better than government. What went wrong in this instance? The government was in charge still. <laughs> uh, we, we had individuals there that promised us as, as uh, those state representatives that everything was on track. We continually heard that uh, throughout interim sessions, discussions, that everything was good, and everything was on track. So individuals not following up to make sure that the private sector was doing their job, uh, I believe that's still a government problem. We have to make sure that we evaluate, we study, we make sure that, that we're paying people to do the right thing. And when that doesn't happen at the government, government level, uh, I think that sometimes that uh, costs us. But that's just my opinion. Okay, the next question. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were in Congress right now, would you support the Paycheck Fairness Act that would require women to be paid equally for equal work? If so, why? If not, why not? You know, I support equal pay for equal work all the way across the board. I believe that women should be paid for the same job, equally for the same job that a man is doing. But we continue to strive to make more laws that uh, are unenforceable, that put uh, uh, more liability on the employer, that ends up in being nothing but a lawsuit city that costs business the opportunity to continue to expand. We need to enforce the laws we have on books. There should be no discrimination anywhere. Uh, and I believe we have laws for those. We just need to make sure that we enforce the laws that are in place. Thank you. All right. It is undisputed that local rancher Cliven Bundy has been disobeying federal court orders for many years now and continuing to trespass and use federal land as if it was his own. And you have publicly supported him last April, uh, including appearing at a rally of Bundy's armed militia. Even if you don't agree with laws and courts, do you think that it's appropriate for someone who seeks a federal office to support willful disobedience of federal court orders and to support armed resistance to federal law enforcement officers in order to continue that disobedience. Let's be very clear about what I supported. At no time did I enforce Clive and Bundy not paying his fees, their EMUs, 
What I did support <laughs> is the fact that he was trying to uphold state lands rights, state privileges that he uh, had never been purchased from him uh, in the proper direction in my belief. The courts have deemed that he was wrong. The courts had the opportunity to go in there and remove those cattle. But when we have seen what happened, you know, Clagman is blamed for uh, the civil disobedience out there. It wasn't him that first brought the guns, that brought the law enforcement out there. People were tasered because they took pictures. When did that become against the law as a First Amendment right? It wasn't him that had snipers sitting on hillsides. That brought the individuals here that I don't think we needed to have here. The government did that first. You know, there was a lot that I think I did to try to solve this problem, even working with the congressman here. But there's still answers that haven't been answered. Who give the authority to do that? And why would a government come in and with that kind of force, all over the countryside, we're talking about law enforcement and their overreach. That was the biggest overreach I've ever seen. When people are, are physically uh, abused or pushed around or shot with tasers because of the, the fact that they uh, wanted to take a picture, is wrong. So we can talk about who determined what is here and what I supported. Clive and Bundy, the removal of his cattle, I don't think even he was fighting that. Let him do it. He wanted the right to protest. But the, the government showed up here with a different stance. Thank you. At a recent event in Mesquite, you stated that Mitt Romney's 47% was true and is even worse now. Mitt himself has since acknowledged that he was wrong and dozens of analyses have verified that number would include 44% of elderly people who receive Social Security and a lot of veterans and even active military and disabled people. Can you please tell us what people make up your 47%? The 47% was probably the same discussion that Mr. Romney. You know, people make inappropriate statements all the time. You know, I'm not one of those people that's uh, here to think about and have a poll tested words every time I turn around. I'm not one of those individuals that are uh, afraid of saying what he's got on his mind. I come from a, a like I said, from a ranch and a farm. I speak my mind uh, and try to accept other people's opinion without uh, offending individuals. But like I said, I don't do poll tested words. I'm not worried about that. I believe that it's my privilege to say uh, how I want it. You know, uh, politicians have a, a way of speaking to where they make sure that everything's correct and functional. I don't worry about that as an individual. At the end of the day, uh, do you want somebody that's plain speaking, open minded? Uh, but you know, uh, there's many politicians, good politicians, that have been in this state for years and. Uh, you know, if people want to remove that individual for individuals for uh, maybe gaps that they want to talk about, then I am going to gladly stand in line when uh, the people remove Senator Harry Reid for some of his statements. Thank you. about your disapproval of the actions of Clive and Bundy last April during his standoff with federal law enforcement agents. Nevertheless, the BLM left and Bundy continued to allow his cattle to trespass, seemingly without consequence. Why hasn't the federal government been able to enforce the court order? Thank you, Mike. Uh, Clive and Bundy is a lawbreaker, and he will be held accountable as any other uh, person who breaks federal law. Again, please, no applause. The BLM also used excessive force and did not handle the operation properly in the collection of those cattle. And there needs to be accountability for both Clive and Bundy and his failure to follow the law and there needs to be accountability and oversight of the BLM to properly respect uh, individuals' right to protest. Now, where it stands today, and I am in regular contact with the sheriff and with 
uh, entities that are handling the federal investigation, including the FBI, uh, there, that investigation <laughs> has to be completed. It is no longer just a civil matter. It is now a criminal matter because federal criminal laws were broken or alleged to be broken. And therefore, uh, it has to be handled in a much different way than the BLM attempted to handle it in the first place. So that process has to play out. Uh, and, and Assemblyman Hardy uh, is right. During the height of that conflict, uh, I came out here to Mesquite and met with local leaders, including Assemblyman Hardy, and we worked to defuse the situation because we believe that no one should have been hurt over cattle. And we're glad that that did not happen. Uh, but ultimately, Cliven Bundy needs to be held accountable. He is not a patriot or a folk hero. He is a lawbreaker. And those ranchers who have followed the law need to be held up as the example for public lands, not Cliven Bundy. Congressman Horsford, let's switch areas for a minute. And I know we'd like to talk everything about Mesquite and what influences us, but as a member of Congress, you have uh, some significantly larger issues to deal with. <laughs> the United States appears to be getting involved in another Middle East military situation with uh, ISIS. Uh, it's scary. We know they are bad folks and they need to be stopped. Uh, I'd like your opinion on what you will support today and if you could see a case where we would be drawn into another war where we have full complement of boots on the ground. Thank you. Right now, uh, the conflict uh, that's occurring with ISIS uh, is a conflict and a threat to the Middle East and that region, uh, not a direct conflict or threat to the United States, or at least a not in an imminent threat or risk to the United States. I supported uh, the bipartisan uh, vote that did happen in Congress on the Senate and the House, where we approved um, airstrikes along with our international allies, including uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Jordan, among others, um, and, and other international allies, as well as the authorization to train and equip moderate Syrian fighters through December 11th. This is not an authorization of war. Uh, if that is necessary, then the Congress needs to debate and ultimately vote uh, to enter into any type of long-term conflict. That is not what we are in. If that is where we get to, I do not support U.S. troops uh, being sent over to fight a war uh, that is not the United States war to fight. I believe the policy today is that this is not a go-it-alone strategy for the United States like prior conflicts. Uh, that we need an international coalition of allies that needs to be led uh, by Muslim communities so that this doesn't become ISIS against the United States, it will become ISIS against the world. Because they are a small faction of people, <laughs> albeit very extreme and radical, and they're barbaric, but they do not reflect uh, even the views of the Muslim community. So I do not support our troops being sent there. I know my opponent and others have said that we may have to send them. I would not authorize or approve that action as a member of Congress. You supported equal pay for equal work, including the Paycheck Fairness Act that was rejected by House Rep uh, Republicans. Can you tell us why you supported the bill, whether there is a paycheck inequality in Nevada, and what the bill would do for your female working constituents in past? Well, I support pay equality uh, because um, I'm married to a wife and I want my wife to be paid the same for doing the job <laughs> that the man across from her does. I have a daughter and I want her to be treated the same as my two sons 
And yes, there is pay inequity in this country. Uh, for every dollar that a man makes, uh, women make 77 cents. And here in, the, in Nevada, that it's better at about 85 cents on the dollar, but that is not equity. Um, and I disagree with Assemblyman Hardy. There is a role for government to uh, have an even playing field. We do not discriminate in this country. I, I don't support the concept of 47%. I believe in equality and equal treatment for every person. And women deserve equal treatment, and it's a shame that in 2014, we're even having this debate. Yeah. It is. It's a shame. And uh, so I will continue uh, as an advocate for issues around equality and to address the income inequality that exists in this country as well. One of the reasons that we need to address uh, the pay for women is that women are now about 40% of heads of households in many families. And when that woman is not being paid the same, that affects that entire family. And if they're on government assistance or in poverty, then each one of us as taxpayers ends up covering that expense. So why should we subsidize corporations when, they, when the average restaurant CEO last year in 2013 made almost $11 million a year compared to the minimum wage worker that made $14,500? That's what's wrong. And that's why we need pay equity at every level so that we can close this income gap and treat people fairly and equally in this country. Congressman Horsford, you sponsored a bill that got a veterans clinic funded for Pahrump. We're also a long way from Las Vegas. <coughs> what are the chances of us getting something like that here? <laughs> well, let me first say it took us over two years. At, this was approved in a prior budget by a prior Congress to fund that Pahrump VA clinic. So I can't take credit for that. That was done before me. But even after it was funded, it took two years to get a piece of paper signed by the secretary of the VA because the scope of the project had changed. And so I literally had to take uh, it upon myself to call every day into the VA office in order to get an answer and ultimately had to go on national TV in order to get the VA's attention. The new VA secretary, after one week of being confirmed, signed that piece of paper, and that's why we're getting a VA clinic in Pahrump. But specifically for what we need here in Mesquite, because I know we have a high percentage of veterans, and that's why I voted for the VA reform bill. So anybody who lives within a 40-mile radius of a local VA clinic, like Mesquite, you can go see a private doctor in this community. Um, all you have to do is get a VA card that allows you to see that doctor. That law is now in effect. Uh, it was a bipartisan bill. I was proud to support it. In addition to that, it also provides $15 billion of additional funding, $10 billion for VA health care, and $5 billion for VA benefits care. Because we have to keep our promise and our commitments, not just to the men and women who serve us on the battlefield, but once they come home, to get health care, to get their benefits paid, to have access to housing, to not be homeless, and that's why I supported that VA reform bill. If you don't know how to get to see your doctor, I have an outreach office here, the third Wednesday of every month, 9 to 10.30, you can come down at the Senior Center, come and talk to my staff so that you can find out how you can go and see a private doctor and not have to go uh, out of the community to see uh, a doctor for your VA needs. Yes. Yes. That's almost as good as having a clinic here, right? Back to the issue of pay. A lot of people in Mesquite work full time and are still below the poverty line. Some work a job and a half and are still below the poverty line. Do you support increasing the minimum wage to a level that is at least as high as it was in 1968 when I was getting it? Uh, of course, as adjusted for uh, inflation. <laughs> if so, uh, yeah, both of us, I'm inflated too. Um, what benefits do you think that would bring to the scheme if it was enacted? 
Uh, I do support increasing the federal minimum wage to $10.10 an hour uh, because of what I said earlier, which is today, $7.25 an hour equals $14,500 a year. And uh, two-thirds of minimum wage workers are women. Half of them are head of their household. And this is a problem in this country where we have to address the inequalities that exist. Now, I supported the increase in the state minimum wage to $8.25, a dollar more than the federal minimum wage, set on inflation. And that was a bipartisan agreement. Um, I had colleagues in the state Senate that voted with that as Republicans because they understood that it was good for the economy to help move uh, people uh, into the middle class. And this should not be a partisan issue because uh, there is recognition uh, that by supporting those workers in the middle class or minimum wage workers, it helps the economy. That people have more disposable income uh, can go and spend that money at the local restaurant or uh, the dry cleaners, uh, you know, taking their kids uh, to events. That's how our economy works. Now, I don't support continuing to give corporations and billionaires um, tax subsidies and tax loopholes when we can't give minimum wage workers who make $14,500 a raise. I have nothing wrong against uh, people who are rich. The restaurant CEOs that made $11 million, God bless you. But they need to recognize the only reason they made that $11 million in 2013 was because of that minimum wage worker who was selling uh, that product to all of us as consumers. And they deserve the opportunity to provide for themselves and their family uh, just like that CEO who made $11 million last year. We are now differing from what we've done before, and each individual will have five minutes for a closing statement. Will your clock set for that? <laughs> okay. Okay. And because we started with Russ and Hardy, we will end with Stephen Horsford. So you have five minutes. Well, first, thank you, Al. Thank you to the media panel, to my colleague, Assemblyman Hardy. It's great to be here. And for all of you, this is how democracy works. Yes. For you all to be here uh, for as long as you have to hear from all of us as candidates who are asking for your vote and your support, thank you for coming out and caring enough about who represents you. Um, I decided to run for Congress after serving in the state Senate for eight years because I wanted to make a difference. Um, and I don't just say that uh, rhetorically. Congress is broken. As an institution, it is failing the American people. And I am as frustrated as you are in why our government can't work better. Um, it's too partisan, and there's too much gridlock. And as a freshman in the minority, I didn't go back to Washington uh, to be part of that. I went back there to represent all of you. And in my first year, um, I worked to be effective, like the Las Vegas Review Journal, who endorsed me recently, said that I had been as a freshman. I worked to be bipartisan, passing legislation, uh, including the land jobs bill that I passed out of the House Natural Resources Committee and out of the floor unanimously. Bills don't come out of Congress and the House unanimously. It only happened because I worked in a bipartisan way with my colleagues, Assemblyman Mark Amade, or Congressman Mark Amade, as well as uh, the Republican leadership on the committee. And finally, I was, I'm there to be a voice for Nevada. Not special interest, not for the corporations or the CEOs. They have lobbyists. They have representatives. I'm there for you. And every time I take a vote, I think about you. I think about the fact that Nevada still has the most unstable housing market in the nation. That 30% or more of our homes are upside down in value. And I call them homes because to me, a home is where you create memories with your family. It's where you raise your children. And for people to have lost everything in this downturn has really hurt us to our core. 
But we're coming back and things are getting better. But we have to be able to work together to solve problems. So I was appointed in April to serve on the Financial Services Committee, which is the Housing, Banking, and Insurance Committee. And I'm not there for industry, I'm there for you. Already, I'm bringing legislation forward to help address the housing crisis here in Nevada, because that's what I've heard so much about that we need to fix. I'm also focused on the jobs front and the economy, and that's why I'm working with your mayor and city council to get this Mesquite Lands Bill passed because I know what that will do to our community. And it's a model for how we can transfer federal land back to our local communities. I agree with my uh, opponent that Nevada should have more control and a stake, but there's a way to do it, and there's a way to make that happen in DC, and there's a way to just talk about it. And in one year, as a freshman in the minority, I found a way to break through that gridlock to get it done. And so that's why I'm asking for your support. Every two years in the House of Representatives, you get to decide who represents you. And I'm honored that there's 700,000 people who hired me to do a job two years ago. And I'm fighting for you. And every two years, you get to decide whether or not our contract should be extended. I'm asking for your support because I care about our state as my a uh, colleague does. I care about Mesquite. Every community is different. And I do think that we need to have solutions that help benefit this community as we try to address issues across the entire nation. And I have voted against my party and the president when it has been in the best interest of the people here in Nevada. Whether that's been on the budget, whether it's been against the administration's position on NSA, or as I was talking with the gentleman in the back, when the president proposed capping cost of living increases for people on Social Security, I said to the president, that's wrong. I won't support it, and I won't support your budget. I actually voted for uh, Chairman, Ryan budget, uh, Ryan, Chairman Ryan's budget that year because it did not include uh, a, a cost of living cap on Social Security. So I'm asking for your support. I appreciate you being here tonight, and thank you very much for allowing me to serve you these first two years, and I hope that I can continue to do that for many more years to come. You know, first of all, I'd like to thank the, Mr. Clemenson for his hospitality and his staff, and what a wonderful job they've done. I really appreciate that. Appreciate the congressman to coming here and uh, having this opportunity. You know, I've been asked, why am I running? And you know, as an individual, uh, there's only one real reason that I run, and it's kind of personal, self-serving even. You know, I, I believe that my children don't have the same opportunity that I had as a child growing up. You know, I worked for minimum wage back in 1975, and I believe it was uh, 265 an hour. I never looked at that as a career opportunity. I looked at that as a step, stepping stone opportunity. I used that to get out and actually improve myself and look for those higher paying jobs. Uh, we as a people need those opportunities, we need that training somewhere along the line. Uh, so, you know, the, to bring it to $10 an hour, maybe no big issue, but minimum wage uh, should not be a government controlled issue at any time through the process. I'd like to see all Americans make more money. That's the reason I'm running. But I have four children and a wife that I love to death, two new grandchildren, and I want to reduce the debt and the deficit we've got in this country. I believe it can be done. Washington, D.C. has a problem, and it's a spending problem, folks. Uh, those that are in Washington, D.C., I don't believe or have the willpower to address the problem and overcome that addiction. I believe I do. I understand what debt and deficit causes, but you can change with improvement. Also, we talk about uh, equality for women. You know, over the last uh, four and a half years, four million women have dropped below the poverty level because of the administration's policies. I don't think we're going the right direction there either. You know, I have four daughters, or four children, uh, two of which are daughters and two sons. And I want my daughters to have everything that I have and everything that my sons have or anybody else. That's the reason I'm doing this, is I think that I can make a difference. I want that opportunity to change. 
That's why I'm asking for your vote. As far as the partisanship and the bipartisanship, you know what? In the last session, I was in the uh, uh, minority leadership. And what I learned from my, between my first and second session is how to work with people. I got to know the people on the other side. I got to know my own uh, caucus, some of which I don't approve of some of their uh, philosophies either. Uh, you're never going to agree with me all the time, but I think you agree with me 99% of the time on issues. But I learned how to work with the Speaker of the House. We accomplished more in this last session, and this come out of the press, not my language, that this was the most uh, cohesive, um, collegial type uh, group that's ever come out in the last 30 years in the legislative session. You know, I brought some uh, eff uh, efforts here to Mesquite. The 118 exit is now being built because of a bill that I was the one that tracked it all the way through the Assembly and the Senate. Uh, that takes a lot of hard work. It was the most divisive bill out there, but I brought people from both sides together to be able to accomplish it. I also helped develop what was called the Southern Nevada Caucus. You know, for years, uh, the North has had uh, caucuses. They call it the Northern Caucus. They call it have the Rural Caucus, but we've never had a Southern Nevada Caucus for years. I worked with the uh, Speaker of the House to develop that caucus where the Senate and Assembly all come together as a body from the South to work on issues for this state and for the South that were their, you know, their different spots in the North and the South. And I think we accomplished some good legislation that will strengthen jobs and the economy, that will uh, strengthen the, the uh, health, DHHS uh, programs. Uh, mental health issues is a large issue. We continue to spend money on uh, certain things that I don't think the state government has a responsibility to take care of, but we lack sometimes on the, those obligations. We're to take care of the people who can't take care of themselves. Mental health issues need to be addressed. The governor's uh, made a good step by uh, putting committees together. That's part of something I've had the opportunity to do. I know I'm not your refined politician, nor do I desire to be one. Now, what you'll hear out of me is the truth, the way I know it every time. I'm not here to, to run for the next go around. I'm here to do what I can today for my family, which I believe benefits all of you in the long run. Again, I thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity, and I appreciate your vote, and have a great evening.